Let us pray. Eternal God, our Father, we thank you and we give you all praise today. This is the day you have made and we are rejoicing and we're glad. Now we have come to the hour we, we are at the place where we want to be fed your word. Now I pray that you would give me insight, that you would help me to think right, help me to speak right, and then help us to hear right. That's my prayer. And we pray in Jesus' strong and powerful name. And the church says amen. Thank you. For some time now, I have been teaching on carnality and the cure that God gives us in his word to carnality, which is which is one of the cancers, if you will, when it comes to the body of Christ and its growth. The word carnal is the Greek word sarkikos, and it means to be unregenerated in the mind and to be flesh-ruled and self-absorbed and Later on, we look at Galatians chapter 5, and Paul outlines for us there what carnality produces. Now, to expedite today's message, I'm not going to get into what we have already covered, but I really want to try to move forward and deal with the cure, and I want to focus in on really the second part of the cure to carnality. Sexual immorality, self-absorbed behavior, deceitful manipulation, anger issues, an argumentative disposition, jealousy, disagreeable, associating with divisive or divisive factions, illicit drug and alcohol use and abuse. All of these are the fruits of carnality and many more. The writer goes on to say in the 21st verse that those who live, and please listen, this way will not inherit the kingdom of God. You cannot live a carnal life and inherit the kingdom of God. Now, in the eighth chapter of uh, Romans, and I need you to focus in on that, remember that, mark it down. In the eighth chapter of Romans, we are taught that those who live this way, uh, we're taught two important truths in that eighth chapter, verse 6 and 8, concerning those who are living carnal lives. And the first thing that the writer wants us to know is that living carnal, it is impossible to please God. Now, I know what Hebrew, the 11th chapter says, it says, without faith it is impossible to please God. But if you are living a carnal life, the scriptures also teach us that you cannot please God living carnal. And then the second thing that it teaches us in the sixth verse is those who continue, please listen, those who continue to live carnal, in spite of being warned, 
that they need to repent and make changes. It tells us that they will be condemned by God to eternal damnation on the day of judgment. Now, the choice is always ours. We can blow it off and act like we have plenty of time and and that's not something we need to deal with now. Or you can hear the warning cry. Because the truth of the matter is, we don't know when our number will be called. Every last one of us, that's why Jesus says, take no thought for tomorrow. Today is what you got. And that's why he says, when you hear it, when you hear God's call to change, respond that day. Say amen. We don't have as much time as we think. In God's word, he gives us the cure to carnality. And we've been laboring with this uh, for a few weeks now. Uh, and I want to I wanna bring that up. If we will take the medicine that God prescribes in his word, we can be free of carnality. And listen to me carefully. Carnality is a mindset. It's the way we think, and it, it controls every aspect of our being when we are carnal, which basically means we're self-absorbed, unregenerated in our mind, and we're only thinking about ourselves. And that will get you, that's a prescription for eternal damnation. We learned that the first step in curing carnality is to begin the process of renewing our minds to what God's Word teaches. Everybody say amen. Now please hear me carefully. It's the first step in the process. We got to renew our mind to what God's Word teaches. In other words, we got to get some Word on the inside of us. And God's Word is there for our consumption. Now, we know that God has gifted the body of Christ with those Apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers, and they have the responsibility of perfecting or maturing the saints, growing us up. But, but don't just lay it on the five-fold ministry. You have a responsibility yourself to get in the Word. The Scripture says, study the Word. Uh, so that you would be a workman that needed not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Your responsibility is to get in the book, say amen. Uh, Deuteronomy, excuse me, uh, uh, Joshua, it says, This book of the law shall not depart of our, out of our mouths, but we shall meditate therein, what, day and night. And observe to do. Not only are we responsible for ingesting the Word of God, but we got to do more than just ingest it. Say amen. Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2 says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a, a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is your spiritual service. And then he says, And be not conformed to this world but be what? Transformed. How? By the renewing of your what? You've got to change your mind. And the way you do that is by ingesting the Word of God. You've got to get into the Word. You've got to get into the Word. I'm saying that over and over again. If all you're doing is depending upon a sermon on Sunday to, to be your word diet for the week, you are fooling yourself. You got to get in the word 
all during the week. Say amen, somebody. In James chapter 1 and verse 21, it tells us that the renewing of the mind to God's word is how we save our souls from eternal damnation. Jesus took away the thing that destined us to eternal damnation. Now the choice lies with you. What you do will determine where you end up. And so it would behoove us to get in the Word and to begin the process of renewing our mind. James 1 and 21 says this, So get rid of all the filth and evil in your lives and humbly accept the Word of God, the God Word that is being planted in your hearts. And then it says this, For it has, say God's Word has, the power to save your souls. And everybody's soul needs to be saved. Isn't that right? Sure it does. And so we dealt with that, but this second step is really crucial, and that's what I want to really focus on this morning, which is to begin acting on the word you are being taught. Now, I want you to hear me when I say this, nothing in your life will change until you act on the Word of God, until you begin to become a doer of the Word. Now, some of us think that as long as we are listening and in the house and gathering with the folk, that that's good enough, and the reality is that doesn't change you. What changes you is when you begin to take the word that you've been taught and you begin to act on the word. Say act on the word. James 1 and 22. Everybody, if you got a Bible or a phone, whatever kind of device, everybody turn to James 1 and 22 because I want you to read it for yourself. I want you to know what it says. It's not the hearers. It's not what you are exposing your eardrums to that really produce change. It's when you act on what you hear. That is when the power in the word is released in your life. Did y'all hear what I just said? So the word is being planted in you, but it, it lies dormant until you act on it. So you've got to what? Act. Say act. James 1 and 22 says this, but don't just listen to God's word. You must do what it says. Otherwise, you are only fooling yourselves. And there are a lot of people who think because they can quote Scripture that that is a sign of spirituality. And I'm here to tell you, it's not what you can quote, it's what you act on. It's what you are doing. Say amen. I can quote that I'm supposed to love my wife, but if I'm not actually doing it, I haven't changed. Are y'all listening to me? The Bible says, wine is a mocker, strong drink is raging, whosoever therefore is deceived is not wise. I can quote that all day long, but if I don't put the wine bottle away and leave the strong drink alone, I have not changed. Does everybody understand what I'm saying? The earth is the Lord, the fullness thereof, and those that dwell therein. I've got to act like I belong to God. Say amen. Some of y'all didn't hear that. We have to act like we what? Belong to God. God is our head. Jesus asked the question, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I say? It's not you confessing him as Lord. It's him saying, you are my child by the way you act. 
So it's got to be more than us just what? Hearing. And people think because they go to the assembly, because we come to church and we gather together, that that means we're good with God. That don't mean nothing. It's not you coming together, hearing me holler every Sunday about you need to get your life right until you begin to act on the word. Nothing will change. Romans chapter 2, verse 13, it says this, for merely listening to the law doesn't make us right with God. You say, I'm righteous. Well, that don't mean you're righteous because you're listening. What makes us righteous with God is obeying what we hear. When we do what God's word says, then we align ourselves with God's word, God's mind, God's will. And so I have to change and not just become a hearer. Say amen. I got to do more than just listen to. And we got all kind of apparatuses that help us to listen to the word. But if you don't take that word and begin to act on it, then it won't change your life. How many of y'all understand that? Merely listening to the law doesn't make us right with God. It's obeying the law that makes us right with God. Now, before we go to the next slide, we had a wonderful meeting in men's ministry on yesterday. I mean, when I say we had a wonderful meeting, uh, we were blessed because we dealt with some real issues. And I want to talk about that just for a few minutes. One of the things that hindered the body of Christ is holding grudges and being unforgiving. Did y'all hear what I just said? I said, oh, holding what? And being what? If I had to ask or answer the question, what is the most, what is the, what is the, 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 the sin that trips up most people in the body of Christ that will lead to their eternal damnation, the answer is holding grudges. I said holding what? Now, we have gotten to the point now where we think it's okay to hold a grudge against a brother or sister in the body of Christ, in the church. We, we, we don't understand how holding a grudge will send us into eternal damnation. We think we're justified, listen, in getting mad at somebody because that somebody didn't do what we want them to do. Are y'all hearing me? And we think we can hold a grudge and then it'd be okay and God overlook it. And I'm telling you today, that's a lie from the pit of hell. I want you to hear me clearly. Holding grudges is a mortal sin and will send you, listen, into eternal damnation. You got to get that right. Say amen. Now, I'm saying this and I'm laboring with this because I know the condition of most people. They will hold a grudge for years and you don't even know why they have art against you. And then if you go back and you ask them, What's, what, why isn't it right between you and that other person? And most of the time, they done forgot why they have a grudge against them. They just know they got a grudge. And so they've been treating them crazy for years. Are y'all hearing me? We were talking in the men's ministry on yesterday, and one of the things we started talking about was loaning money. How many of y'all loan money? How many of y'all, 
Have y'all loaned money? Everybody raise your hand. You done loaned some money. How many times did the person you loaned the money to blow you off? Has that ever happened to you? Yeah. Now, we got two problems. Now, I want you to listen to me, and then I'll be done. The first problem is we are told that we are supposed to give if we got it. That's what God's Word says. He says if you have it, you're supposed to give it. If you don't have it, you, you can't give what you don't have. Somebody say you can't get blood out of a turnip. But if you have it, you're supposed to give it. But the problem with that is we don't do what the Word says. And then we set ourselves up when it comes to the other person because we don't do what the Word says. The Word teaches us if you loan somebody, if somebody says, hey, can I get 100 till payday? Can I get 100 till payday? When's payday? Well, payday's three days from now. Okay. You say, okay, I'll give you 100. Now, you're going to give me my money back? And what do they always say? They always say, yes, I'm good for it. You know, we brothers. Yeah, right. We, we good for you that. Okay. So you give the $100, and then two days later, when their payday comes, they're nowhere around. Say amen. They don't even call you. And then three weeks later, you hear that they're getting ready to go to a vacation at some destination, some remote destination in the world, and they still owe you $100. And so all of, all of a sudden, now you got a real attitude. Am I right? Now, the first problem is that we don't know what the Word says when it comes to loaning. And I'm trying to teach y'all, do what the Word says and you'll be all right. So we got to hear the Word, but not only do we got to hear it, we got to what? We got to do it. The Bible teaches that you are never supposed to give a loan unless you take a pledge. You say, What? I said a pledge. Brother Drink was talking to us about one of his situations, and he said, take a pledge. Yeah, I said the Bible teaches that you're supposed to take a pledge. In other words, when somebody comes to you and says, I need $100, you're supposed to respond and say, well, I, I do have the $100, but what can you give me to make sure you come back to me when you say you're going to come back to me with my hundred dollars, the Bible teaches you're supposed to get a pledge. The only thing you cannot take from them is their blanket if that's the only thing they got. Because it's their blanket and they need it for warmth. But that ring on your finger... Or that nice bicycle you got in the garage that you love and worship? Are y'all hearing me? Or them nice Stacy Adams shoes that you pay for? Or them Jordans or whatever? Are y'all hearing me? See, the problem is we don't want to do what the Word says. And you are never supposed to just entrust yourself to somebody's Word. Because people will lie to you. So you say, I need something. Now, let me give you this example. A brother, well, an individual came to the church, came, knocked on the door. They knew me, and they said, hey, uh, Pastor, I need, need $300. Can you help me? I said, well, I can give you $300, but what are you going to give me? And he said, what do you mean, what am I going to give you? I said, I need you to give me something so I can, don't have to chase you down when it comes time for you to pay it back. That's what the Word teaches. Did y'all not know that? So he said, well, I got I to gotta ride a lawnmower. I said, good. You go get your ride a lawnmower, and you come on and meet me here tomorrow, 
and you drive it down the street, and, and then, you know, I'll give you $300 because I know you want your ride lawnmower back. Y'all still here? And uh, the individual came down with a riding lawnmower. It wasn't the one he cuts his grass with. And I looked at it. I said, okay, uh, does the blades engage? And he went to try to engage the blades, and the, the blades wouldn't engage. I said, listen. If you're not willing to give me something that you don't want to lose, then the deal is off because you're not willing to give me something. Now, he was going to give me a broke lawnmower and wasn't going to show back up, and then I got to offload this broke lawnmower. And I would have had to be feeling some kind of way about that. Y'all understand what I'm talking about? And so in order for me not to feel that kind of way, guess what I said? No, you can't give me a pledge, then you can't get the loan. Now, here's what happens when you say no or you don't allow somebody to do what they think they have a right to do. And as a pastor, I have had more people get mad at me because I didn't do what they wanted me to do because they felt we were buddy buddies. And I'm here to tell you, I'm not your buddy. I'm your pastor. Say amen, somebody. Had an individual, and I, you know, I, I'll tell the truth. I don't, had an individual said to me, they wanted me to buy them a washer and a dryer. And I said, I'm not buying you a washer and a dryer. Well, I've paid tithes for these many years, and I think you owe me a washer and dryer. Now, he wanted the washer and dryer because he was moving into a new house, and he thought that the church should bless him with a washer and a dryer, and I had to tell him no. Now, he got angry with the no. But listen to me. He had no reason expecting what he asked for because he didn't have a right. Are y'all listening to me? Are y'all listening to me? And so from that moment forward, he had a grudge against me. Do y'all hear me? He had a what? Grudge. In other words, he felt negative towards me. Now, did I sin against him? No. No, I just didn't fulfill his expectation. Do y'all hear what I'm saying? So many of us have grudges against one another because of the simple reason we didn't fulfill someone else's expectation of us. And here's what I'm trying to get you to understand. When you develop a grudge, that's a one-way ticket into eternal damnation. God forbids grudges. Go to the next slide. Holding grudges is the number one reason church folk are headed to hell. Did y'all hear me? I said the number what? You know why people nine times out of ten leave a church? Because of a grudge. They leave a church and they go somewhere else, but they haven't dealt with their grudge. And so it follows them. And they got a rude awakening when they <laughs> have to stand before the king. God don't forget nothing. Are y'all hearing me? Listen to what Leviticus 19 and 18 says. Do not seek revenge or bear a grudge against your neighbor. 
Is that clear? God does not allow us to bear grudges. He doesn't allow us to seek revenge. Now, I'm sharing this scripture with you. So this is the first step in curing carnality. You got to what? Hear the word. You got to what? You got to what? You got to hear it. You didn't know. Some people didn't even know it was in the Bible. And yet here it is. You mean I can't seek revenge? No. You are never supposed to seek revenge because of any action another person does towards you. And when you do, you take it out of God's hand and you put it in your own hand. Do y'all hear what I'm saying? Do not seek revenge. So, somebody that doesn't get what they want, what did they do? They go poison someone else. So they say, guess what he did? He didn't do this for me. I don't understand why he didn't do this for me. That ain't right. That ain't right. That ain't right. And then weak-minded people who don't know what the word says and don't understand that that individual is operating under a spirit of grudgment, they allow themselves to be poisoned by that individual who's holding a grudge and now those who have been poisoned by that individual they can't look at you the same way they used to look at you and you've done absolutely nothing to them that's the problem in the body of christ people hold grudges we had a situation, I, I, you, know, I, you know, we do certain things in this church. Uh, we have annual festivities, and, and uh, we, we count on people to work and do certain things. And so we came around to this particular time of the year, and, and uh, we were lining up those people that were supposed to be working and volunteering and giving their service and one of the people weren't responding to the call. And then we're like, well, what's going on? So I had to call the person. I said, now, what's, what's going on? Well, to tell you the truth, I don't want to work with such and such. I said, what do you mean you don't want to work? Well, she did something to me that I didn't like three years ago. How many years? Do y'all hear me? Now, for the last two years, she worked with her. But at the third year, that grudge had eaten her to the point where she said, I just don't want to work with her. See, instead of people being up front and talking to one another, because nine times out of ten, most people ain't trying to hurt nobody. Y'all hear me? You want to take and you want to get mad, but you want to put on that Christian counterfeit crap. Are y'all listening? And you want to act like it's okay with you and your brother, but then when you got to work in close proximity with somebody because you, you really have animosity and anger and hatred towards that other person. You just don't want to be in the same room with them, and it always eats at you. And the Bible says, do not seek revenge or bear a grudge or bear a grudge or bear a grudge against your neighbor. The way you cure that is by conversating. Talk. Are y'all hearing me? Now, a grudge is different than, than you having someone sinning against you. If someone sins against you, you're supposed to go to that person and you say, hey, you sinned against me. You lied on me about this. And you're supposed to go to that person and you're supposed to talk it out. And if you can gain that person 
uh, back, then you gang your brother, and it's only supposed to be between you two. Say amen, somebody. And if they won't hear you, you're supposed to get two witnesses. Go talk to them. And if they still won't hear you, you're supposed to take it to the church. And then you, if they still won't hear the church, then that person obviously is lost. And we are to treat them as a heathen and a publican. That's what the Word of God says. But if you got a grudge against somebody, the issue lies with you. You had an expectation that you should not have had when it came to that individual. Do y'all hear me? And so, unfortunately, we, we are, we have allowed you in the church to have grudges. And I'm here to stop it in the name of Jesus. No more what? Not if we want to make it into the kingdom. It says, do not seek revenge or bear a grudge against your neighbor, but love your neighbor as yourself. And then he says, I am the Lord. Now listen to this, Romans 12 and 19, and then I'll be done. Dear friend, never take revenge. Did y'all hear what that just said? So that means you can't seek the demise of the individual you had a grudge with. As a matter of fact, what you're supposed to do when you have a grudge against a brother or sister, you are supposed to go into your closet and repent. Everybody say repent. Why? Because there's something inside of you that God needs to dig out of you, and it needs to be cast far away from you. And if you don't do it, it will stay there, and it will, it will turn into bitterness. And then you got a grudge against this person, you got a grudge against this person, you got a grudge, and it will kill you. And that's where we get into this fake smiles. Come on. When we're around each other, we, we, we throw that Christian smile and that pat on the back, and yet you walk away saying, I can't stand her. Or he makes me sick. And yet you don't understand because you're holding a grudge. That's a one-way ticket to eternal damnation. You cannot. People leave one church to go to another church. Why did you leave? Well, the pastor this or the pastor that. And you know what I tell people when they come to me? I say, go back to them. Now, people don't understand. You know, go back to them and repair the breach. Did y'all hear me? Because the scripture says, if you know your brother or sister has ought against you, or you have ought against a brother or sister, before you can offer your gift up to God, go and be reconciled. Did y'all hear me? Go be what? Now listen to me. You can know all this and do none of it. Did y'all hear me? So it's not, it's not you knowing it that will change your circumstance is you doing it. But you got to first what? Know it. And then number two, you got to start doing what the Word of God says. How many of y'all understand that? I thought about it today. I said, I wonder how many people in this body have grudges against each other. I wonder how many people are willing to stand up and say, you know what, I do have a grudge because, you know, in 1972, uh, are y'all hearing me? Something, something what, silly. 
But how do you get over that? Amen. Bless you. The way you get over it is by you examine yourself. And when there's that kind of stuff in you, you've got to face it and get it out of you. Because you have no justifiable reason to hold on to a grudge. God teaches you not to. Now, I've heard people say, I'll never forgive him. I'll never forgive her for what they did to me. Well, what did they do to you? And then they come up with an elaborate story. And I said, you do realize if you won't forgive, God says he will not forgive you, your trespasses. And they don't even think it or consider that. You know why? Because they could care less. They want to hold on to what? Their grudge, their anger, and their unforgiveness. And holding on to it, please hear me, is a one-way ticket to eternal damnation. That's why Jesus said in Matthew 7, not everybody that says to me, Lord, Lord, will have entrance into the kingdom of God, but only him that does, everybody say does, the will of my Father which is in heaven. Now, we have a choice this morning, don't we? Yes. How many of, our, of us have had a grudge with somebody? Raise your hand. Okay. Now, some of us still have that grudge. It's the truth. Because here's the truth. No one is supposed to ever have a grudge. And you having it, maybe you didn't understand you weren't, in order, you weren't supposed to have a grudge, but you are not even supposed to what? Have a grudge. Say, have a grudge. But now is the time, because we know what the Word says, is to cast it away from us in the name of Jesus. You're here today. I'm going to give you an opportunity. Come to this altar. Whatever grudge you are bearing, it's time to release it in the name of Jesus. I want you to come forward. Amen. And we're going to pray. Come on. Don't be scared. Stop acting like you already took care of it because you didn't. So hurry up and get up here. Come on. Listen, this is for you. Because if you don't deal with this, it will condemn you. Come on. Y'all, listen. Come. I said what? Come. I didn't say stand. I said what? I said come to this altar. You know what you got that you haven't dealt with. Come to this altar. <laughs>